Good evening and welcome to Shop Talk, hosted by the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. This is the second Shop Talk of the year, and well, uh, hopefully there's an enjoyable one. Now, the rest of the crew is out today. Mala is uh, on secret mission. Uh, Mike and Tracy are also on secret missions, so I shouldn't have separated them out. But you got me here, at least for a little bit because I kind of have the game on over on that screen. So we're going to try not to let that distract too much. But in case this is your first time here, welcome to Shop Talk. The idea of the show is this is a little bit of an interactive chat uh, discussion. If you have questions about data platform, especially SQL Server, drop them in chat. We'll talk about a couple topics as well. And that's the way it normally goes. Usually it's how quickly can we derail Kevin? The answer is usually pretty quickly. With not too much further ado, I am going to share the first article of the night. This one is something that Mala wanted to point out, which is, I can turn off spotlight here and uh, no longer maximize. There we go. So this is an article from Hugo Cornelis. This is actually a few months old, but it's still good. It's good information. The uh, article is all about is the merge operator any good? I mean, that's kind of the, the way to phrase it. So in SQL Server 2008, we got merge, which is, if you're familiar with Oracle, very similar to the upsert syntax. And merge was fraught with some issues early on. So the main problem with merge, there were a few bugs with it and also some misunderstandings in how the operator actually works, which means that uh, in practice, people had some problems with it. And what Hugo did here was he said, okay, so a while back, Aaron Bertrand put together a blog post. And this was, I, I want to say this was several years ago. So there are comments in here from 2013. So this is shortly after SQL Server 2012. And, you know, we can see some longer uh, responses, a lot of comments about how the merge operator had some issues. Um, so Aaron had this list of, hey, here are all of the problems with the merge operator as of 2013. Some of them were, we're not going to fix this. Some of them were, yes, we will fix it. Some of it was uh, under review whether or not they were going to fix it or not. And Hugo said, okay, um, that happened in 2013. And then a couple years back, Michael J. Swart also put out an article about, hey, if you're using merge, here are some things to keep in mind. So I'm going to drop links to all three of these in chat. So this is Aaron's article that really kicked things off back in 2012 and kind of convinced me, eh, maybe I don't want to use merge. And then after that, we have uh, Michael J. Swartz's article on considerations for whether you want to use merge or not and what you should think about. And then Hugo's blog post is, let's do an update. How are things in the year 2023 when it comes to merge? And as we could see from the original uh, table that Aaron had, you know, there were a lot of items on that list. That's quite a few bugs. It's quite a few um, issues where the syntax isn't really fully supported. And just in general, uh, not, a great, not a great operator for regular use. And now Hugo's gone through and done a lot of the grunt work of, all right, should we simply say avoid merge altogether or how is it today? And uh, Hugo did have a discussion with some MVPs. I got to observe. I didn't respond at all to it, but there was some nice back and forth discussion in here. And uh, Hugo's gone through all of the items and said, okay, how many of these have been fixed as of SQL Server 2022 and CU7? Um, so the question is, can we use merge? And the, the short answer is that if you avoid one really bad issue, then uh, merge is actually not bad as long as 
you have the right uh, concepts in mind. So Hugo's argument is, hey, general advice. If you just want general advice, we're not going to talk about the specifics of your circumstances. Don't use the delete action in merge and be careful when merge is going into temporal tables. Um, also, one other thing that I would add into this is remember that the different operations in a merge statement are not transactionally consistent. So it's not like you have everything happening by default. Uh, all of the inserts and updates and deletes are all happening as one atomic batch. Um, it is separate operations. Now, what this will uh, end up dealing with is you can wrap that in a transaction and you can use things like hold lock and uh, just make sure that you are operating on things with some level of consistency. So that's the general high level advice, but going into some of the issues that were plaguing the use of merge in the past, it turns out that it's not as bad at today as it was a decade ago. Um, so for example, if you're using simple recovery for your database, then you can have an assertion error message and uh, Hugo says, hey, either this has already been fixed or I, I wasn't able to reproduce it is basically what he's argue, what he's saying. Um, now we need to rethink common knowledge. I know it's so painful having to actually rethink about things. Um, but yeah, every once in a while, every once in a while you have to. By the way, welcome in, Anders. Good to see you. If you're using change data capture, then rows updated by merge may be logged as delete and insert rather than an update. And that is uh, also true when you use the update statement. So, you know, that is back from vacation. Yeah, nice. Um, basically, conclusion, it's not merge specific. It may or may not be a bug, but, you know, if you use update, it may still show a delete and an insert because sometimes that's just what happens. And basically, this issue really isn't one that affects, it's not a merge issue. So, okay, we're two for two in terms of, eh, not that big of a deal. When you're using memory optimized tables, you can't use merge. Now, for the few companies that are making good use of memory optimized tables, that can kind of suck, but... Um, in memory OLTP is one of those things where I wish it could do more than it really ended up doing. I, I was hoping that it would have been more of a uh, pin this in memory, keep it in memory, and make reads faster. What it really is for is write, making writes faster and making specifically the writes of certain types of operations faster. So if you're writing into a very narrow table with mostly integer values, then a memory optimized table can be really good. But reading from that table, it's not really any faster. So kind of sucks, but um, that's, that's really not relevant to merge. So, okay, you can't, you can't uh, use merge to write to a memory optimized table. Not a big deal. Um, yeah, Hugo's verdict, feature requests shouldn't be used to discourage the usage of merge. Um, maybe, maybe. I mean, I could say, I could say that, hey, if, if for example, uh, heavily used type of operation, like you couldn't merge into a table with column store indexes, if that were the case, then I think there'd be a much stronger argument uh, for this because there are relatively few memory optimized tables to begin with. Not a big deal. When you're using full text indexes, so if you have a text column that's full text indexed and it's part of a partition table, and that table has a non-clustered primary key, then the full text index does not get updated. That is kind of a very limited subcase. Um, and, you know, Hugo says, hey, I wasn't really able to replicate this, and it, it worked, everything worked fine, so maybe it's been fixed, or Maybe there is some other, you know, narrower edge case. But basically, um, if this is your reason not to use merge, not a big reason. 
So required circumstances are already a pretty rare combination, and I agree. First of all, full text indexing is already pretty rare. Secondly, partitioning on full text indexes is even more rare. And third, using a non-clustered primary key. That's really uncommon. I think uh, I would I would estimate that probably somewhere around 80 to 90% of primary keys are clustered. And maybe it's actually probably even higher than that. I would say 80% plus of planned tables are uh, col or clustered primary keys, where the unplanned tables, the stuff where people just go through in the GUI and say, yeah, 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 that's fine. I mean, the, your primary key is going to be clustered by default because that's that's the default. So, you know, you're if you add in all that, you're probably pushing us up to like 98, 99 percent of tables that have four or primary keys have clustered primary keys. An application has full text on about 400 columns. That's a lot of full text indexing. Um, Glad it works for you, assuming it works for you, Anders. I I have not had great success with full text indexing, but I also understand that the type of things that I was trying to do with it really didn't fit. Actually, that was one of the rare cases where I would actively promote using Lucene or Elasticsearch as, hey, this is a great technology. Don't use Elasticsearch for aggregating measures. Don't use Elasticsearch for trying to add numbers together. That's awful for that. Use it for search. Use it for, I have a block of text and I need to find some pattern within that text. It works. <laughs> it works adequately. Um, maybe not even adequately, but, you know, I'm feeling optimistic today. It's The score is 21 to 7. Uh, I got my Squirrel Winters t-shirt on. I think, I think we're doing well. So, okay. Full text index. Eh. Uh, merge merge shouldn't prohibit you from, or full text indexes shouldn't prohibit you from using merge. So I think that's fair. Column store indexes. Hey, speak of the devil. If you have a table in tempdb that has a column store index that is also the target of a merge and the insert target of its output clause, the statement may fail with an assertion error. Uh, so the bug does exist, but apparently it's only in tables that are in tempdb. So... That is an extreme fringe case that you can work around. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it'd be cool if that were fixed, but I would also, I would agree that that's not a reason to say don't use merge at all. Um, just why are you creating tables in tempdb with column store indexes on them? Eh, and I, I'm, I'm actually not sure. Let's check this out if it has to be, if it has to be a uh, DBO table or a, a proper table within tempdb or if it's a temp table that you have created in some uh, database. So here they are creating dbo.1, dbo.2, not temp tables. So I think this is a proper table that is in uh, tempdb versus a temporary table that is created within this uh, context of any database, which in that case, yeah, I get back to tempdb is not the best place to create proper tables. Uh, so, so yeah, don't probably don't do that. All right. Old connect item. When the target of a merge is a partition table that has just one partition, the statement may fail with an assertion error. And Basically, Hugo's saying, hey, if you have a partition table, why do you have one partition on it? You shouldn't define that table as partitioned. Um, alter table switch works without issues, regardless of whether the source and target are partitioned or not. Yeah, it's true. So Hugo tried the statement executed without an assertion error. Data was modified as expected, so maybe it has been fixed. But I do agree that, eh, not a big deal. Um, unique filtered indexes. And let me double check on here. So the feedback item does not include repro steps. Repro has so far failed. Um, so there's a couple of notes in here. Conclusion, I'm going to assume it's fixed or maybe it was failed. Uh, this bug is fixed in SQL Server 2019. It's all right. Good enough reason not to do that, or not to worry about it. Temporal tables. Now we're getting to something interesting. 
if the target of a merge is a temporal table and your associated history table has a non-clustered index defined on it, you may get an error attempting to set a non-nullable columns value to null. Now, uh, Erland has a repro script and it exists. So the bug is still there in SQL Server 2022. So if you remove the index or you don't create it, the merge statement will run just fine. But if you uh, do have the non-clustered index, then you get a little bit of an issue and Hugo delves into what it, what exactly uh, is going on here and you know some basically what he assumes is the problem. But essentially, this is the uh, this is I think one of the key problems of hey, don't use merge with temporal tables. So there's nothing in the documentation to say that merge shouldn't be used. So I should expect it to work, and I agree. I think merge should work just fine when temporal tables are involved. It it should be orthogonal. So yeah, fix the bug, please. Um, and until that bug is fixed, don't use merge with temporal tables. Unless you never create a non-clustered index on the history table, which frankly, if you're going to use history tables, you're probably going to want to have non-clustered indexes on there. So I, I wouldn't want to assume that there are no non-clustered indexes on that history table. You know, those history tables get pretty big and the non-clustered indexes are about the only way that we're able to effectively retrieve data from them unless we're going exactly by the the, the um, primary key of the main table. So yeah, I, I agree. Don't use merge with temporal tables. Um, that's fair advice. If you have a delete operation on a table that is used in an indexed view, we're already getting into some rarefied air here, but if the target of the merge is used in an indexed view and the merge includes a delete action, the indexed view may not be updated to reflect the, the deleted rows. Okay. So there is a bug. It is still a bug. And uh, the merge statement combines an update and a delete action. When I modify the script to do only the delete action, the execution plan for the merge uh, looks like the plan that he's showing on screen, but I'm not going to dive into that. Um, but he's explaining, hey, what's going on when you do an update? What happens when you do a delete? And uh, the, the key problem is, until this bug is fixed, don't use merge with an update and a delete, but no insert. So uh, the delete operation with merge is okay on its own. Insert and delete is okay. Update and delete may not be safe. If you have no indexed views, then you don't have to worry about it. But yeah, you know, like like he mentions, somebody may create that view later. Somebody may create an indexed view and then suddenly stuff breaks and you're like, why is this not working the way I expect it to? So if you're in an environment where you never use indexed views, um, then it, I think it's okay to not have to worry about it too much. But indexed views tend to come out as this is a performance issue that we're going to want to try to resolve with an indexed view. And you don't tend to think about, well, what does the rest of the infrastructure look like? Do I have this uh, merge operator anywhere? And if so, then I need to revise that code. So that's, that's a weird thing. I think this is a, this is fair to call a bug and it's fair to call a reason not to use merge um, when you only have update delete or, yeah, when you have update delete. Um, concurrency issues. If you have high concurrency, merge statements may uh, be subject to race conditions. And that's because insert, update, and delete are separate operations. So repro script does work. Hugo was able to get a, a race condition. You can see this goes back to 2009. So this goes back to the way that merge works versus, I think, a, a proper bug. And when you look at the execution plan here, we have a clustered index seek that is reading an existing row, and it'll use a shared lock that only exists for the duration of the read. As soon as the uh, row is in working memory, then the lock is released. So lock gets released right about here. Row goes through a few operators, and there's a clustered index merge on the right here to update or insert it. Well, the race condition happens if you have two connections running the same code 
nearly the same time when the row doesn't exist because the first one's gonna say, oh, there's no row. So it's checking for a row. Nope, there's no row. I want to insert. The second one is checking while the first one is maybe like right here. The second one says, oh, I, I wanna check. Oh, there's no row. So let's insert. And so you have an insert followed by an attempted insert that fails instead of what you would expect with an update. Uh, a way to fix that would be if you hold the lock here until you insert, but now you're talking about, hey, I need to have a table lock. Um, so yeah, if you're willing to take a table lock, then you don't have this problem. But knee-jerk reaction is to blame merge. It's a bad one. Um, so if you tell people it's an issue with merge, they'll just replace it with an update and an insert, except you know the way that you write this code is exactly the same. It will give you the same uh, type of problem. And actually, as Dan himself found in 2009, that version of the code is even more susceptible to race conditions. So what you might do is uh, check to see uh, where exists or not exists. And if you, if you use that without the if exists, with using just like a, a where exists and where not exists, um, but if you put these in the original stored procedure and rerun the test code, you will get primary key violations. Yeah, because we're doing a check. So you're checking for existence first, and then you're inserting. So um, all in all, not great. So you have that same pattern. And basically, yeah, you could use a hold lock hint instead of releasing them. And, and that is the solution. Um, but why would you apply that solution after ripping out merge? Why not just have the hold lock hint with the merge? And yeah, I'd, I'd call that fair. So conclusion, um, don't blame merge for this race condition. This is just insert and update operations. So merge is still okay. Uh, potential, potential issues with triggers. Merge statement can cause the same trigger to execute multiple times, and triggers may have an unexpected value in row count. And so uh, Hugo has a link to a blog post here. This one is from Aaron. And the repro script apparently still works fine in SQL Server 2022, but it is not a bug. Um, basically, if you have an insert followed by an update, uh, of the same row, so you insert a row and update the row, or you update the row and then delete the row in the same, let's say your, your criteria for update and then delete match up enough, then you'll get two triggered rows. And, you know, frankly, you know, like Hugo says, hey, when you write trigger code, you have to realize sometimes the same thing can get called twice. Uh, you better be able to handle those multiple rows. And that, I would agree, that's not a bug. Um, that is just, this is the way that triggers work. You do have to dig in, and it is one of the problems of triggers it, that they are not, they're kind of opaque to end users or to, to the DBAs, to the uh, application developers, to people who didn't create the trigger. So it's a little bit opaque. And when handling multi-row operations on triggers, we tend to th not think about that. We tend to think about the row that gets updated when multiple rows can get updated and we may have, may have to handle multiple rows in a trigger operation. And we may have multiple trigger calls on the same operation because you have an insert clause and then an update clause. Well, if you have an insert statement and then an update statement that both hit the same row uh, and you have that trigger, then you're going to get hit twice. So this is this is not a merge thing. This is a this is how triggers work thing. <laughs> Avoiding merge because you don't understand how it affects triggers is like always driving your car in second gear because you can't be bothered to learn how to use the clutch. That's fair. Also, when I had a manual uh, transmission, I could definitely go. I could start in second gear. So it's got that going for it. All right, complex syntax. Some people complain the syntax for merge is too complex and you can't remember it. I mean, it's not like it's pivot or anything. Uh, pivot is the most deceptively complex T-SQL that I can think of. And just 
you know, think right now. Can you write if if I put a gun to your head and said write a pivot statement or you're done? Could you do it? I'm not sure that I could. And I've written dozens, hundreds, dozens. We'll call it dozens of pivot statements. And it's so deceptively simple because you have, you know, select pivoted columns from and then your select query as the alias pivot the aggregation function and the column being aggregated for columns in your list of values as your alias with a possible order by clause. Without Google, yeah, no, without Google. You're, I open up SSMS, blank screen, say write the pivot or, or the dog gets it. And I can't do it. Um, every time, every time I have to do this or I, chick, I chicken out and I do um, case max. So select case when, uh, or excuse me, max case. Max case when value equals zero, then dollar amount. When value equals one, then dollar amount. When value equals two, then dollar amount as multiple columns. And that's typically what I end up doing because uh, I just can't remember the pivot syntax. So, okay. Merge SSIS to Excel, pivot win. Yeah, but then you have to use SSIS. And okay. I have to rant for a moment. You have, you have done well, Anders. You have thrown me into, into a self-destructive rant. Um, I had a video that, I, that just came out. SQL Server Integration Services on Linux. By the way, if you want to check out the video, it's like half an hour long. 20 minutes of this is me complaining about SSIS because uh, this thing's not supported in Linux. This thing's not supported in Linux. This doesn't work in Linux. Oh, you're on the newest version of Ubuntu that's supported? Nah, it doesn't work. You can't use Ubuntu 2204. Um, oh, we have these restrictions. You can't run an SSIS operation as a SQL agent job. There is no integration services catalog. Like the integration services catalog is the only reason SSIS has been relevant in this decade. So first one for the year, I, I may have had a rant. I think I had a, a rant last time around. Uh, we did do one on January 1st. But we're going through this. You know, I, I'm going through all these restrictions. And what's really funny is in the video, I point out here are all of the different restrictions. And you know, when I took the screenshot, I realized, oh, I'm on SQL Server 2017 on Linux. Hang on, let me go to the 2022 page. And I go to the 2022 page. The list of restrictions is exactly the same. They have done nothing in the past five years for integration services on Linux. So my strong advice, I have a 30 minute video on the topic, mind you where I actually show how it works, how it actually works. If you want to go down that route, just install SSIS on Windows and uh, you can write integration services packages using your SQL Server on Linux as OLADB sources or destinations. Don't even worry about trying to run those packages in Linux. Um, you can for some packages. There are, I would say for 70 percent of packages, as long as you're not using third-party components, then you're probably okay running it in Linux. But third-party components are one of the things that make SSIS bearable. Like uh, being able to say, do logging with Task Factory or SFTP with Cozy Rock solution or uh, the Task Factory solution. Stuff that frankly should have been an integration services 10 years ago, never really got there. Good logging never really got there. Uh, by good logging, what I mean is, oh, my row failed. Please tell me how my row failed and write that failure to a log where I can find here are the actual failed rows and here are the problems with that row so that maybe I could correct them instead of just getting an error that, oh, uh, insert failed. You know, please, please tell me how did it fail? Why did it fail? What failed? Nah, insert failed. Meanwhile, Task Factory comes out with their solution and, oh, surprisingly, it actually does the job. But can't use Task Factory on Linux, so don't use SQL Server integration services on Linux. That's that's my final 
I could have boiled that 30 minute video down to don't use, don't use it on Linux. Okay. Complex syntax. I mean, merges, maybe it's a little bit more complex than it absolutely needs to be. Uh, let me double check if I can pull together the syntax for the merge operator. Let's paste that in. By the way, here's the syntax for the merge operator. And, okay, merge, there is top percent, which, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think I've ever used merge top, uh, but you can do merge top. And I'll show a few examples. Uh, I, I find that it's usually better to walk through the examples and there's a lot on here about merge, so quite a bit to keep in mind. But, okay. Merge. Here's your table that you want to merge using, uh, here is your set of inputs. What do you want to merge on? A merge inside a cursor in a trigger. I hate it already. I hate it already. Okay, when you when matched. So, hey, we found these inputs, so your source and your target. If you match, then update. If you don't match, then insert. And you can output. Uh, the output clause basically just says what happened on here. Uh, here's deleted.star. So anything that was removed. And deleted in here means the deleted row or the... Uh, it was actually a row that was deleted or the um, prior to an update portion of the update clause. So deleted.star action, which is going to be insert update. It'll be an insert or a delete usually. And then inserted.star. So that way you can see what the before looked like, what the after looked like. Yeah, it's not trivial, but I also don't think it's, that complicated. Um, I, I would say, you know, write me write me the equivalent of this using insert and update and delete clauses, and you'll have some similar. Uh, you, you'll probably have more lines of code. You'll have some uh, duplication. You'll have the same thing, the same clauses showing up two, three times. So I would say on net. I don't think merge is that terribly complicated. So um, I'm going to be blunt. If you do consider merge too complex, my co my response is boo-hoo, cry some more. The create database statement has more options, and you manage to learn that as well. This is your job. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. I mean, Hugo's not wrong here. Um, also, there is this thing where I can pull up the the syntax. I could Google it. There are plenty of people who have written examples about it. You can spend some time. I, I think part of the complexity, like part of the complexity with Pivot is it's not that Pivot itself is hard. It's that, well, I write a Pivot statement once every four weeks. And in between Pivot statements, I forget the syntax for Pivot. So it just doesn't stick in my head. When I go and write the pivot, it's not like, oh, wow, this is incredibly complex and I need all of my brain power to think this through and how it's possibly going to work. The syntax for pivot isn't that crazy. It's just there are several small pieces that, okay, I, gotta, I have to go and Google it every time because I just don't keep it in my head. And I think that's also fair. I think it's fair to have a reference to know where the reference is, what the references indicate, and what you get out of them. And you know what? Once you do that, uh, you can do the same with merge. So, agreed. Along this whole art, uh, list, I don't think I found anything where I really disagree with Hugo. Um, which is good news, because hey, that says, unless you're using merge in a very specific circumstance, you're writing into temporary or temporal tables, 
you're writing into a temporary table on tempdb or excuse me a non-temporary table on tempdb a a permanent table in tempdb which again why um so you're writing into a temporal table or you have update and delete and your table is involved in an indexed view in those circumstances merge is bad there are bugs Hopefully they'll be fixed at some point, but there are bugs. Otherwise, it's nowhere near as bad as it was a decade ago. A lot of this stuff, it seems, has been fixed. And so do not use merge with a delete action. Do not use merge to target a temporal table. Avoid those two. This is, this is like uh, having a mogwai. Don't feed it after midnight. Don't get it wet. No problem. You can have all the mogwais you want. Next, you're going to tell me that PLE of 300 is not enough. <laughs> and also that your, uh, your cost threshold for parallelism needs to be above 5. Um, page life expectancy of 300. I, that, was, that was really important 25 years ago. Uh, but since then, you know, if your page life expectancy is 300 at this point in time, you got problems, son. Um, your PLE should be a lot higher than that. And I know you're joking, but you know, for, for the people in the audience who are not aware page life expectancy, the, the idea behind that is that this is how long a page is going to stay in memory. How many seconds does your average page stay in memory? So 300 seconds is five minutes. The idea would be that, if you have memory pressure, the, the least used pages, the least recently used page gets moved out of memory, new page gets pulled into memory, and uh, your operations are read from memory. This, by the way, is part of why in-memory OLTP doesn't really make your queries faster. The reason is reading, you're always reading from memory. The only part that gets faster is if you're reading a page from disk into memory first, and then you're reading from memory. But as soon as the, the page is in memory, you're just reading from memory. So your in-memory OLTP table, which is already in memory, versus your regular table, if you have pages already in memory, read performance really isn't going to change. Um, so that's kind of, kind of the disappointment that I experience with in-memory OLTP. And have to remind myself that read wasn't the reason they created that. It was really for write. So, um, your pages, five minutes in memory, that's not very good at all. That means you're reading things out of memory a lot, and it says you don't have enough memory. Or your queries are bad, and you're scanning a lot of uh, data from tables that maybe you don't need all of those pages. Most of my servers sit at 12,000. Uh, 12,000 is a pretty good number. 12,000 would be what? three plus hours, three and a half hours, thereabout. So, yeah, it's not too bad at all. Uh, 200 minutes, yeah, about three and a half hours. And what that's saying is, all right, your average page is staying in memory for three plus hours. Well, you're still cycling things in and out, which means that you have more data on disk than you have RAM available. Okay, that's the norm. Um, but that... Your pages, you're keeping the most recently or most uh, frequently used stuff in there for longer. And, you know, you're saying that, hey, I'm not writing, I'm not reading a lot from disk, where reading from disk is a lot slower. No matter how fast your disk is, it is still considerably slower than reading from memory. Even if you're direct attached NVMe, that stuff's extremely fast. It's still several times slower. If you're reading from an SSD, that's direct attached, it may be an order of magnitude slower. If you're reading from a SAN, you know, it may be one to two orders of magnitude slower than just reading from memory. So uh, it interacts with banks. So because they're all closed today, 188,000. That works. I like that. And hey, if you have more, if you have more memory than you have database size, why write pages out ever? Uh, that's, that's the real life. That's the real trick. And once you get to it, that's when you know you got it made. So Hugo's advice on the whole, 
Merge is okay. And there were some comments in here. So DBCC pen table. Yeah, that was that was kind of what I wanted in memory OLTP to be. But as as it turns out, um, you don't make reads faster. With pen table, that was a very old command that was SQL Server 2000. I think they removed it in 2005. But the idea would be, I want to keep this entire table in memory. I never want it to be paged out. So your least recently used mechanism for cycling a page out of the buffer pool, I want to ignore that. I want to keep these pages in regardless. And you, know, you could use that for really common lookup tables, very common moderately sized tables. And that way uh, they don't get cycled out because, well, I know it hasn't been used recently, but it's going to get used soon. And even that wasn't incredibly effective because the whole idea is if your pages were going to get cycled out, then uh, they're not being used right now. There's something else that's being used right now that is probably more likely to get reused. And so by pinning a table in memory, what you're doing is you're, you're saying the stuff that is actually more frequently used is not staying in memory. And instead, I'm going to keep this in memory. And when you think about it that way, uh, you realize that, you know, for, for most cases, this is actually a bad thing. Number one detour of Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Well, in fairness, Anders, um, this is the only real thing that I have on the agenda today. So I appreciate your detouring. Otherwise, I would have shut down Shop Talk and watched the game instead. Um, but I have the game run right here. It's it's every time I glance over here, you're going to realize I'm, I'm watching the game. Okay. And Michael does have a follow up where you know, he says, hey, thanks for this. And I, he wanted to make it clear. Um, there's a game. Yeah, Buffalo and Pittsburgh. They So yesterday is when the game was supposed to be played, but there was a lot of snow that hit the upstate New York area, and they moved the game to uh, start at 4.30 p.m. today, uh, which is why I'm wearing my, my Squirrel Winters shirt, which, in case you don't get the reference, um, this was last year when they had the game the uh, where Buffalo got about six feet of snow overnight, and they had to move the game to Detroit. Um, Josh Allen, during the game, he was talking to the sideline reporter, basically said, yeah, my buddy Squirrel Winters got me out. And he came over with his plow and just kind of plowed the whole area and uh, helped me out there. And at the time, it was like, did he just troll national media by making up a dude's name and seeing if, they could, uh, if he could get it going? But it turns out, no, there really is a guy named Squirrel Winters because it's upstate New York. Of course there's a guy named Squirrel Winters. Uh, second quarter of Packers versus Cowboys. I, so I tuned in right around the two-minute warning for that, right when the pick six happened. It was fun. Um, so, okay. Michael comes in here and mentions that, you know, his his coming in was merge can't be that bad, can it? And partially was right. Yeah, it's not that bad. It has improved. And that's what I want to get at. That I think in 2010, it was perfectly reasonable for people to look at merge and say, I don't want to merge. I don't want to use merge. I don't want it in my environment. I also think it is perfectly reasonable in 2024 for us to come in and say, you know, it's okay to use merge. It's nowhere near as bad as it was a decade ago. It's much better. Um, there have been some nice follow-ups on here, some nice bug fixes. And I'd say um, it's not too bad. There's one additional merge issue. Results in cannot insert duplicate key points to a non-unique index as a culprit. So there may be other specific instances where you might have an issue that you run into, but in a lot of cases, they, they seem like those are edge case scenarios. They're, uh, well, if on a blue moon, when I have these four features enabled and these three features disabled, and I have these two index hints, then merge has this problem. And I think part of that is just, you have a really complicated product in SQL Server, and you're not gonna be able to hit all scenarios. I also think that uh, here's here's me getting into my own rant. I'm derailing myself this time. The fact that they no longer test nearly as much as they used to 
really has hurt SQL Server the last few years. Um, the 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 spin that they put on it was, oh, well, we're doing all of our testing with Azure SQL Database, so we're fixing all the problems there so that you have a rock-solid on-premises SQL Server. And the first edition where they really did that was 20... I, th they, I forget if they did it for 2017. They might have. But definitely for 2019. That was something that they were pushing. And continued in 2022. Well, 2019 and 2022 have had several instances where there have been massive breaking bugs, uh, including one where a CU had to get rolled back because, oops, um, we accidentally corrupted your backups because you had a very common feature turned on. And those sorts of things, I don't know if they come out if they had the same level of rigor in testing that they did six years ago, seven years ago. And I do think that has hurt the product a bit. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it's going to change. I don't think they're going to go back to having a large dedicated testing team who are working on uh, trying to find regressions. I think it is going to be, oh, well, we're going to rely on Azure SQL DB as our mechanism for finding regressions. But the problem is that you don't find some of the cases that are weird customer scenarios. And so, and even relying on your EAP customers who are really good about, hey, we, we find a lot of the issues so that you don't. Um, yeah, I, I worked for a company that was part of EAP and part of TAP uh, before that. And yeah, found a lot of issues in SQL Server 2016 that got fixed. That's cool. It's really good that there are those customers. Um, however, there are scenarios where, you know, it's just, you're not going to find it because, oh, it requires this kind of a SAN, or it requires this kind of a weird configuration that not a lot of people have. And the best that Microsoft can really do is, okay, well, we have learned from a customer that if you have this kind of a configuration, you can run into this kind of a bug. We can create a test to try to build a regression around it and, try to create an automated test to, to resolve it. Now, I don't have any uh, insight on how, what that kind of testing solution looks like, but I do know that they did mention several years ago that, yeah, the, a lot of the the test engineers got uh, reassigned or laid off. I forget exactly what it was. And there was the spin at the time of, oh, well, that's because Azure SQL Database is doing such a great job of of being our test environment that you're getting a rock solid product. And I just, I don't think we're getting that. So that's my, that's my rant promoted to customer. Um, yeah, well, okay. So those EAP customers, um, those are, it's basically you get early access to SQL server and you're regularly meeting with Microsoft. It's actually a really cool program, uh, especially if you enjoy trying out the, the cutting edge Basically, um, you work with the CTPs, and you don't typically put those in production, or if you do, it's a very limited production. Like, very few companies are, are going to rely on a CTP for their mainstream work. Instead, they'll have several servers out of a few hundred. And um, in that kind of a scenario... What they're, what they're doing is, okay, well, run through your regular workload. Do you find any issues? Do you have any bugs? How are you liking the new features? Do you find any bugs in the features? And regularly meeting back with Microsoft. A lot of the EAP customers get selected for large workloads, uh, strange environments, a lot of throughput, a lot of concurrency, things that maybe are, are stressors that they're, they and Microsoft are not easily able to replicate, and therefore... Uh, have a little bit of a tough time, and I just had to watch that pass um, while I while I tried to finish my sentence. But they may have a tough time building that out themselves. So, do about eight thousand restores per week. In five years, I've had two failures. Uh, yeah, if and I will also say, as much as I complain, just complained about bugs getting introduced, things happening in the product that. I've had problems with. Um, it is still generally a very good product. I, I think, I, I wish I could call it rock solid. 
It's not rock solid, but it's really good. And also, this was one particular cumulative update, Anders, that uh, got rolled back. And let me see if I can find... Uh, let me see if I can find which one it was because it was a, uh, it, there was a problem and maybe it was 2019 because SQL server. Um, I remember that there was an issue. There was some build that introduced a critical bug. Well, that is not new. 6.5 SP4, when it was released, was just SP3. That's kind of crazy. Test in production allows for saving valuable dollars by having customers do QA. You're not wrong. You're not wrong, Solomon. Um, all right, maybe this one I could find. Oh, I'm still... I'm still looking to see if I could, if I can find when this thing got rolled back, uh, because there was one that one of the CUs they said, "Hey, don't install it," and they actually pulled it from their uh, list of CUs, and I, I don't think you can download it anymore. And the reason being that. Uh, there was there was a critical bug. CU four. Was that it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Here it is. This is from Brent Ozar. Um, SQL Server twenty twenty two CU four. That's the one I was thinking about. So if you have an index that explicitly specifies descending. And your query has a where filter on that sorted column using an end list or multiple equality searches, and your query has an order by with the sort order as the index, then you may get incorrect results. So uh, that kind of sucks. Also, memory dumps every 15 minutes if you have both query store and parameter sensitive plan optimization turned on. Also, kind of sucks. Um, so yeah, that was that was an, the issue that I was thinking about, and um, I think CU4 ended up getting yanked. And there may have been a 2019 critical bug as well, because I thought that there was something that that involved not what Brent was mentioning there, but backups. Um, CU2 of 2019 had a critical issue with the SQL Server agent. And XP agent enum jobs. Um, that was that would be a problem. And you know you'll find you'll find some of these things. Oh, here it is. Here it is. This is this is the one that I was trying to remember. This one. Drop a link here. CU seven for SQL Server twenty nineteen RTM was removed, and the reason is that uh, database snapshots. So if you create a database as snapshot of syntax, like you're running CheckDB, um, there was an issue. And I'm trying to see what the issue was. Uh, let me see if I can if I can find it because that one was a pretty big deal. Uh, let's see. Go to... Here's uh, Brent again. Oops. A bug involving snapshots. Oh, it's the same blog post from Srini. So yeah, looks like... Um, if you're using the database snapshot feature explicitly with create database as snapshot of, then there could be a problem. Haven't kept up with any 2022 issues. Yeah, this one, I remember when it came out and it was, uh, <laughs> if it had not been fixed in CU8, there would have been no CU8. So Pedro's, Pedro's, uh, bringing the snark. 
Um, so yeah, uh, basically, we have seen some issues around this. But I did also think there was one related more directly to backups too. Yeah, I, I vaguely recall it, and I thought it was something like um, compression and backups. I, I remember that there was a big bug with compressed backups and TDE, but I think that was SQL Server 2016. So in fairness, you know, my, my argument that, hey, things have gone a little bit downhill since 27 or s since 2019 um, doesn't really apply there because this was 2016, back in the Halcyon days when they had testing, lots of testing. And in that case, uh, part of the problem is release cadence. I could see that. I mean, they were... You know, you're you're pushing to release. You've got a lot of new features. You've got a lot of things that you want to try out. Um, you also have those monthly. I got to hit that monthly deadline for the CUs. So I could see that being a problem as well. Uh, but nonetheless, we're actually pretty close to the top of the hour, which um, was amazing. Uh, Two thousand was rock solid at the end because it baked for five years. Well counter that with 2005 which was pretty solid once you put sp1 on it was a while ago pretty sure it was two jobs ago so yeah maybe 2014 or 2016 yeah that sounds about right i think it was probably sql server 2016 because i know that there was one with uh tde related 2005 was not bad for all the changes from 2000 once you installed sp1 Granted, SP1 came out, what was it, immediately after release? Because basically SP1 was all the stuff they couldn't get done in time to put on the CD. And so you had to, to download that service pack. It was, it was sort of like uh, AAA games today, 18 years ago, on release day. It actually, it could have been on release day. Because I just remember that this was stuff like, I think database mail might have been one of those features that they promised in 2005. They're like, you just got to download the SP1 and just get it. Um, granted, that was also before my time. So I'm going back by by historical memory versus what I actually had to deal with. And one last, one last thing. 2005 took away the query analyzer. It did. You know, I never, I never used query analyzer or enterprise manager. Um, I think I opened up Enterprise Manager once, but I do, uh, I just started with Management Studio because I started with 2005. Um, the environment I started with, I, it was in the year 2007. So they were already mostly on 2005. There was like one instance of 2000 and you could use Management Studio to connect to it. And, oh, this is a shame. I thought... So I, I, as our closing issue, Solomon's in here. I'm happy Solomon's in here for this. Uh, this is something that I'm surprised it actually goes back this far. August of uh, 2017, basically saying, hey, I want to write F sharp functions for CLR for SQL Server. And what, me? No, not here. Yeah, no, no. There's a certain uh, fellow right in here who he and I talked about this before and has contributed on here. They have not completed it. Yeah, I so I follow this thread, and I saw two weeks ago that it was completed. I'm like, yes, that's awesome, and then realized that, oh, no, it hasn't been completed. So sadly, hasn't been completed yet. I would love to see it. I assume it was a mistake. Been meaning to ask about the closing action. Yeah, they reopened it. So um, I've been following it really closely because... I would love to see F sharp functions in CLR. And I mean, if you read through, Solomon does a great job in documenting things out. And you can see, hey, here are all the things that you would have to do to get this to work, um, which is very useful, but hasn't happened yet. So maybe, maybe in the future. Uh, database mail used to need a domain account or something like that and would only connect to Exchange. Ooh, that's. Ooh. Um, I'm glad that changed. I'm very glad that changed, especially with the pushing of like web-based mail services where, Hey, all I need is a, 
a username and a password and a SMTP host and send an email because email is a very standardized function that has been around for decades. Kids in your need to send mail from the database. You know, Anders, I actually um, implemented Slack messages using CLR uh, from the database because a, a company that I was doing consulting for, they were like, we don't want email. We just want to have a Slack channel where all the messages go to. And I know in SQL Sharp, there is write to Twitter. So you could write all your messages to Twitter um, because I'm sure there was one customer who paid for that. <laughs> So uh, that write to Slack worked pretty well. It, it did. I, I only wrote certain messages uh, to Slack. It wasn't a mess of things. If you wanted to use SMTP, you'd roll your own table as a queue and an external program to parse that table and send it to the SMTP. Things have gotten better. And then there's Azure SQL Database where you kind of have to you know, create your own automation jobs or whatever. But that's eh, okay. That's all right. I don't have a problem with that. But amazingly, we have reached the top of the hour. So I want to say thank you all for coming in. Quick reminder, tomorrow's user group meeting is going to be in-person only, Andy Leonard. Um, I don't know if we're going to have a recording. I'll talk to Andy, and we'll see if, um, if we can get a recording of it. If so, I'll do the recording. I'll post it to our YouTube channel. Um, next week, I am going to be talking about... Let me see if which one it is. I will say hi for you, Anders. Uh, yeah. Wait, did I really do Getting Beyond the Basics with Azure ML? Okay, yes. So I'm doing uh, Getting Beyond the Basics with Azure ML for our Business Intelligence and Data Science group. That will be online. It will be online only. So if you want to check that out, meetup.com slash tripass. Um, our three meetings a month. One of them will be in person only for now. Two of them will be online only. And... Shop talk again in two weeks. Regardless of when we see each other next, until we see each other again, everyone, take care.